Tell me a little bit about yourself and your involvement in the IIoT. Yeah, so hi, I'm Will Sobel. I am the Chief Strategy Officer of System Insights, and we're a process analytics company that does predictive analytics for manufacturing. Uh, my background is actually in financial technology, so financial analytics, um, real-time systems, uh, fault tolerance, and these kind of things, communications. I got into manufacturing when I started the MT Connect standard in 2007 while I was working at UC Berkeley. And we didn't call it Internet of Things at the time or IoT. We called it data from manufacturing equipment. We didn't, we didn't have that term, but it was it was out there, and what's nice is that now, after I think it was Cisco pretty much coined the term, now the market has suddenly embraced us. So before we were very uncool, now we're really cool. <laughs> Why don't you tell me, what, what are some of the ways that data analytics is used in the industrial internet of things? Well, if you look at things like the McKinsey report and such, there's a huge opportunity to be able to increase the operational efficiency and the productivity of manufacturing systems. Right now, if you look at what's out there, we're probably at about maybe, um, I don't know, 25 to 30%, especially in discrete manufacturing, of actual value-added time on a machine tool versus time being set up or down or just not operational for any one of a myriad of different reasons. With analytics, we can do many things. We can make the make equipment that we have right now more efficient. We can make the processes more efficient. We can increase our automation so that we can actually produce more things and increase the ability to reshore jobs in the US and increase output, increase agility as well. So agility means we'll be able to make more different things, different places. Local manufacturing is a big thing that people are talking about right now. Being able to manufacture anything, anywhere. I mean, 3D is kind of your first, 3D printing is kind of your first instance of where we're kind of seeing this, the beginnings of it, but we're not doing the high um, accuracy things like uh, aerospace and automotive yet with 3D. A little bit, I mean, sort of on the fringes, but not in production. Parts, not, maybe. Yeah, not, not in the large scale production. So. The idea that we can manufacture anything anywhere, that we can also do things like increase in crowdsource design, engineering, bring expertise from many different areas. Right now, if you look at expertise in manufacturing, it's very localized to little shops. And the idea is also with analytics and being able to bring technology to the cloud, to a wider audience, we can actually start to bring some of this expertise, either curated or uncurated, to more places and more shops and increase our ability to manufacture complex components and do things that right now we can't even do because we can't get all these people in the same room. Okay, well you're, you're yeah. pretty high level, right? So let, let's go down, let's mm -hmm. go down a, couple, a couple steps and give me some, some examples of analytics mm -hmm. being used in the industrial Internet of Things and, and kind of how it's, how it's you know, providing these type of benefits. Yeah, so the first thing you need to do is be able to get data from equipment, so machine tools and manufacturing equipment in general. Now the thing that you need to be able to do is get that data in some type of a, what we call a semantic form. And semantics means that we know what the data means, and we know what the data is related to. So it, it, I usually talk about semantics with data capture in manufacturing, two dimensions. The first is meaning, meaning in units. Mm -hmm. I know that this is a temperature, I know it's in Celsius, I know it's a position, I know it's in millimeters. I know what is the position of, I know it's the x-axis. I know it's you know the um, three space position of the tooltip. I know that this is a vibration associated with this motor. The second thing is, what is the context of this data with respect to process? So what are we making? What are we trying to do? What is the intent? Interesting. So when you start bringing these things together, then you can start to understand what the data means within the context of the manufacturing process. And when we start to think about that, then you can start thinking about how to improve it. If I don't know what you're intending to do, and I don't know what the data means, I'm pretty much just flying blind. And I need to be able to figure everything out kind of on the fly using um, just your standard like big data machine learning type techniques, which, which you theoretically could use, but will take you a hell of a long time to get to an answer. 
you need to understand the physics, the process, and the context to be able to start really adding that value. And that's where you're talking about this domain. We really need to pull together contextual semantic data and start mapping it to the process, understanding the processes, and then we can start building up to what I was talking about before. So those are the big picture, that's sort of how the big picture starts to meet the, you know, what you do on the ground. Mm -hmm. And then the data scientists can come in and start bringing these pieces together so that they can then look at the data, know what the data means, and do, don't have to spend all their time doing cleansing and analysis to figure out, okay, what, what am I even working with? Then they can start teasing out what's correlated with what. You know, I get my um, quality feedback. I get you know, feedback from inspection or from in-process measurement and mm -hmm. verification. Now I know, okay, this part was rejectable. Why was it rejected? What happened in this process? What was the signal in this process mm -hmm. that I can now say is indicative of failure versus success? And, and that's, that's interesting. Now, now, what is the data scientist actually doing during that process? What is he, what is he doing? Well, they're pulling together a myriad of different dimensions of data mm -hmm. from the machine tool, the sensors, process, basically pulling it down from what was being made at that time, what tool was being used, how is that tool being used, mm -hmm. um, what is the type of material that's being used, mm -hmm. what is this type of machine tool, and what's special about this machine tool. Machine tools especially, if you look at as an industry discrete and some of the very complex machines they have out there, like that Mazak Akuma, Moriseki cell, these you know, huge multi-axis beasts that can do a number of different things at the same time, Teasing apart what's actually happening in that machine mm. and how that relates to the process and how that signal all maps together mm. is a very complex thing. And that's what they're doing. That's what they're doing. And the teasing process comprises of what? Understanding the domain, doing multidimensional, basically putting this into a multidimensional cube, yeah. and then slicing and dicing it, and then using various different, um, pretty much learning techniques. Mm to be able to correlate the various different signals and outcomes with what happened. Now you have to do it in along a time dimension as well because I mean you're not just looking at like a single point in time. Right, right. You're doing it over an entire range of history. So mm -hmm. you have to be able to tie it all together throughout the entire span. Look for we do a lot of signal processing, basically looking at the various different uh, shape sure. of the data coming through and looking for those shapes and how those map in and seeing if there's deviation in shape, seeing if there's deviation in things like load and balance between different components. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So a study that we've just done for one of our customers where we actually looked at um, the way um, headstock and tailstock were playing together and the load imbalance and load imbalance is actually indicative of a twist, so of course, an unequal right. torque. And because of that, when you realize it on this particular part, when it's doing this particular operation, you have a problem. Also, um, the uh, there was another one that was like a hydraulic actuation of okay. one of the components. Mm -hmm. Basically, you start to see that there's certain things that are happening on the machine at a certain period of time, and the patterns that you see coming out of the data start to correlate with certain quality issues or certain reject issues, even sometimes way downstream. And it's just figuring out how to tie it all together. And that takes, the thing is that you can't go at it without knowing about it's manufacturing. Okay. Yeah. You gotta know domain. You gotta, you know, a lot of the guys we have doing this are data scientists, but they're also mechanical engineers. They know manufacturing. Right. So it's combining, it's really the confluence of data science and mechanical engineering. And the bringing together of those two domains to be able to understand what happens mm and how the data then is related to the signals that you're getting off of this machine. Because a lot of times when you start looking at it for the first time, it just looks like noise. <laughs> you got to turn the noise into information, and that's the whole, that's their magic. And to be able to do that, you have to really understand what you're looking at. I won't even understand it that well, because I'm not a mechanical engineer. Right. But, you know, this is kind of the stories I hear. <laughs> so, from seeing that whole transformation process, you can, you understand just how hard it is to be able to do this and what a level of expertise it takes to be able to get that value out of 
the tons of data that they're dealing with. I mean, we, we get huge amounts of data flowing into us on a you know, minute by minute basis. Sure, sure. All right, let's pop up a little bit. Mm -hmm. I'm a company, I'm approaching data analytics for the first time. What, how should the company get started? Well, one of the things, I mean, first off, whatever domain you're getting into, um, I would say understand the domain, understand what it is that you're working with. In other words, don't just look at it as sort of an abstraction, but look at it as a, uh, do a deep dive. Okay. First thing. So do a deep dive and understand the processes and everything that's going on around that. Um, there's a lot of tools out there right now. Um, first off, I mean, yeah, I tend to push standards because standards, I think, are a great way to be able to get data mm -hmm. with defined vocabulary. It gets you going quickly because you don't have to reinterpret everything and go so sort of start from scratch. So there's a lot of work going on so to try to... with standards then? Yeah, standardize. Understand the process thoroughly, mm -hmm. do a deep dive, yeah. start thinking about standards or looking at standards, see which ones apply to you. Yeah. And then there's a myriad of really great tools out there. Uh, and we're actually, we just did a webinar for the MT Connect Challenge, which was for universities, mm -hmm. on like a toolkit that's in R for handling like MT Connect data. And we do a little um, demonstration of how to use it. So there's a huge amount of resources out there. If you look at like AWS and IoT Cloud, no, I think Oracle has one. Everybody's got Everyone's their got IoT platform. And they're all sort of similar in the same, you know, they have the same, you know, data ingress capabilities yeah. and storage and some analytical layer, whether it's a Lambda type of thing or whether it's uh, various different machine learning tools, they all have those capabilities. So um, I would take a look at how to easily get data in, mm -hmm. um, use these technologies that are out there, the cloud platforms that are out there and the IoT platforms, and then, you know, start figuring out what the value is. So, okay, let's even pop up higher. The first thing you need to know is what are you trying to do <laughs> you know, from an industry standpoint? Absolutely. So we didn't even cover Where's that. Where's the value? Where is the value? You know, where is the money? Show me the money. And so the first thing we need to do is understand, okay, why would somebody want to do this in the first place? What is the value? You know, what is the ROI model? If I were to spend N number of, you know, X number of dollars building this solution, putting it onto my equipment, and using your technology, what kind of benefit is it going to give me? So that's what you got to answer first. And then you have to back out the solutions. How are we going to give these benefits to the manufacturers? And how are we going to be able to enable the manufacturers to be able to um, increase their efficiencies, right. and increase their productivity, and make more money. Because everybody just wants to make more money at the end of the day. So how can we enable people to make more money? Right. And I think the process you're describing is what I call information requirements. And so you, you build those information requirements first that are based on the value mm -hmm. that you're trying to achieve. And then you look at these different tools. You do the deep dive. You see which tool fits you know, best for your particular situation. And I agree. Use a standards-based mm -hmm. tool and then use it, the standards for... for uh, organizing your data mm -hmm. as well, and um, but that's what you're talking about, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, what's the most important lesson? If you're just to share one lesson with a manufacturer, that's again, you know, they're old school manufacturer, mm -hmm. but they need to move into, they want to move into the new um, industrial internet. So, what, what would be your advice? I would start with the low hanging fruit. Okay. I mean, most like what we usually do when we engage with a manufacturer, we start with the easy things. Okay. So things like operational efficiency. You know, do you really know how, off, how much time your machines are making parts and producing and value add versus just down. down or doing other things? Do you really have a good handle on that? So start with the easy things. And then once you can succeed with the easy things, then start getting into the more... Um, difficult analysis, like, okay. you know, in the cut time and analysis along that line. Predictive maintenance. Predictive that's maintenance right. and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, because, I mean, there's a lot of things. I mean, you can get probably about 30% improvement or 20% improvement mm. just off of what most people are doing out there, especially in the small to medium shops, just by exposing the data 
from the shop floor and starting to understand how time is spent, right. how people, you know, how efficiently processes are being. And it's a lot of communication issues between people and you know getting maintenance people over when they need to be and you know scheduling sure. and knowing when things are when people need help and you know material hasn't you arrived or whatever. Help. Yeah. So a lot of these types of problems, let's do those first. And once we get those solved, then we keep moving off. It's basically a continuous improvement process. It's not like you go in there and you say, okay, do these 10 things and you'll be perfect. It's, you know, okay, let's knock off, let's parade them out, let's find the biggest impact items first. Right. And then we got to go to the next items and next items and next items and just keep working our way through until we have reached that sort of, you know, um, the, the limits or, you know, where we're starting to get... Uh, the return uh, yeah, returns, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Reaching diminishing returns. Exactly, yeah, diminishing yeah. returns. So that's where I would suggest, you know, so look at, you know, how to add immediate value. Okay. Again, it's about engaging with somebody and being able to show with minimal amount of effort how much value you can add to their process and how much improvement you can give them. And then you can start to work through and... Uh, manufacturing, one thing about it is, you know, relationships are long-lived. So, you know, you tend to be sticky. So people will make an investment and just keep, mm. Um, mm. you know, as long as you keep adding value, they'll keep working with you. Excellent advice. Where can people find out more about you and your company? On the web. So we're at uh, systeminsights.com. And my email address is will at systeminsights.com. So, if, yeah, if you want to ask me any questions, um, Please do, and uh, we also um, are you know supporters of various different uh, organizations and working with Empty Connect Standard, and so emptyconnect.org. You want to find out more about that standard, and we're also working with the IIC, okay. Industrial Internet Consortium, on furthering the industry in general. Excellent, thank you. Welcome, thank you.